Good evening. Y'all are excited as I am. Thank you, sir. In front of you, uh, and this might just have a chance to talk to you about the format. Yes, great. In front of you, you should have a copy of the question that we, um, we will be asking. Um, as we go through that, uh, we feel free to read along. We have our opening remarks, the questions that we will ask, and then some closing remarks at the end. And so, uh, I'd like to welcome you tonight because you have the floor. Thank you. And I am excited, like we talked about the other day, that I was talking to other people. Yes, I'm very excited about the possibility of being here next superintendent. Just a little bit who I am, my name is Ted Reeves. I am presently the superintendent of Union Parish Schools. I'm going to work backwards with my, I know you've seen my resume, you know, some of my background. But in 19, uh, I graduated from Jones Rawls High School. I had a great career in high school. I enjoyed my high school life. I was fortunate enough to be a part of an athletic family and got a little athletic ability and was able to uh, come to Northwestern and play baseball on scholarship at Northwestern State University right here. I enjoyed my time at Northwestern. had a great time. And I owe a lot to that college because the things that I get to do today are because of my education as a teacher, to become a teacher, that Northwestern gave me. I even had a chance after I graduated to stay and be a part of the community. Norman Fletcher taught me into, uh, I, I, all my life I wanted to be a teacher and a coach. And he talked to me and he said, look, I need you to come be a juvenile officer for me. I said, no, I don't know about that, but I did. I did. And so for one year, I worked for the Natchez Parish Sheriff's Office. And if you look at some of the things that we did, in 1980, I started the Torres for Tots program. I don't know if they're still going on or not, but we, we started in 1980. So I, had a, I, I won't say I had a great time being a sheriff deputy, but it was a great experience. It was a great experience. I went back to, had a chance to go back to my home high school, John Brides High School, as a teacher and coach. And that's what I really wanted to do. And so I went back, had an opportunity to go back, and had a great run as a teacher and a coach at John Brides High School. I had an opportunity to coach some great kids. I'm talking great from the standpoint of athletes, but more importantly, they were great people. And today, they're, they're great individuals. And that kind of goes hand in hand, okay? And so we ended up winning three state championships in, in football. Had a great run as a baseball coach. 95%, oh no, excuse me, 75, we should have 95. 75% winning percentage because we had good kids. We had good kids. And so the ingredients that we had there kind of translate to what we'll talk about a little bit later. Is that if you're going to have a good program, number one, you got to have good students. Are good athletes. Number two, you gotta have good coaches or good teachers. And number three, you gotta have support of the of the people. We had that. We had that. And so we'll we'll translate that as we go forward. Also had an opportunity to, to coach and teach at a small school, Western High School. Class, class C at the time. That was a good experience too. Had a great time doing it. Then I had an opportunity to uh, go to Texas, to Longview, Texas, which I did. There were circumstances in my life that, uh, I'll just be honest, went through a divorce. Okay? So it was an opportunity for me to move out of Jonesboro and start over, so to speak. So Walter Collins was the head coach at Jonesboro Heights High School. He was the head coach at Pine Tree High School in Longview, Texas, a 5A school. Big school. Not like West Monroe, except didn't play football near as good as him. So I had an opportunity to go there. <clears throat> so I took that opportunity and I stayed at Pine Tree High School for nine years as a teacher and a coach and worked up to be the assistant principal of the, of the school before I left. 
I learned how a big school works and how a big school operates. I was there. Had opportunity to become a principal. And that had a small district, Beckville, Texas, which is it was about a double A school. So I had a chance to go be the high school principal. I stayed high school principal for four years. Thought I was ready to get out of this case. I'm tired. I'm done. I'm ready to get out. So I told them, okay, I'm ready to go. Well, things didn't kind of happen the way I thought they should have. So they said, hey, why don't you come back to the junior high program? I said, sure. So I, I became the junior high principal, drove bus route, and had 50 yards on my yard service. I was a busy guy. But I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Then I had an opportunity to, uh, I took my Louisiana time and I took it to Texas. And my mother and daddy, their health began to fail. So I was burning up I-20 going back and forth all the time. So I felt like, you know, they took care of me for all my life. I need to take care of them. So my wife, Ann, who is with me tonight, she wasn't real keen about leaving Longview, Texas and coming to California. But she said, hey, we're in it thick or thin. So we came back and we took care of my mother and daddy today until we put them both in the ground. So how did I come back to Jonesboro as a Jonesboro High School freshman? And we'll talk about some of the things we did there a little bit later. I stayed there for two and a half years or so, and then I moved into Central Office. There at, uh, I was a maintenance director, transportation and maintenance director. I became the interim superintendent. And then I became the opportunity for me to go to Union Parish as the superintendent there. Came available. I was lucky enough to have that position. Union Parish has happened to be a place that my daddy grew up. So I was kind of going back home to a place I never lived, but I've always been there to see that on now. Just a little bit about my personal life. Myself and Ann, we have nine great grandbabies. Not great grandparents, but great grandparents. <laughs> and they love their cup of tea. And their cup of tea loves him too. And so we have three kids between us, two sons and a daughter. And we love our family. They're a big part of our life. Church is a big part of our life. School is a big part of our life. And so once again, it's it's a great privilege to be here with you tonight, and I welcome uh, your questions. Um, Mr. Ray, if you have, like I said, you have questions in front of you, we, we will be taking notes, and so we won't be making eye contact with you at all times. We apologize for that. Um, so, Mr. Eugene, will you leave some? Yes, sir. What is your philosophy on discipline in life? <clears throat> Discipline has got is something that you've got to have. You've got to have discipline. Okay, now I'm going to give you my answer firm but fair. Okay, that's been my philosophy ever since the day I walked in that first classroom. That's my, that's my philosophy today as a superintendent. But I do know that school is not going to function unless you have discipline. Okay, now why do you not have discipline? Is it because of the classroom management of the teacher? Is it because of the uh, the principal who's in charge of discipline is not enforcing it, or is it a combination of all that, plus what's happening at the house? Okay, because a lot of times we've got children that's not disciplined in the house, but then they come to school and you expect them to be disciplined. But to answer your question, firm but fair is how it needs to happen. So what, what does that mean, firm but fair? So what that, means, that means when you I want you to deal with each in the, each kid individually. Okay, you can't put a blanket on every kid. You can't do that. Okay, you got to sure you have in your policy for that school. This is what happens if this, this, or this happens. Okay, this is the punishment for. But then again, you not you got to investigate each situation because it may be just a little bit different. Now, I think one of the biggest deterrents. Of discipline is if you know that child. Do you know what makes that child tick? Okay. Do you know that child's parents? Do you know that child? 
that's one of the things that I want my teachers. If you don't know those that parents' names, you don't know that child. Okay. You got to know somebody in that family. You got to know the background. Because you know, elementary we have an elementary school in our parish that, that struggle with this crowd, just people who are struggling. And some of the reasons are because there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect between some of the teachers and that child. Do you know them? Okay. Give me an example. I always pride myself on knowing my kids, knowing what button to push, whether I was a coach or a teacher. Okay. I had one kid at Beckville High School. Kept getting in trouble. I never could get in turn. I thought, wow, am I losing my grip here? I thought I was pretty good at this. I finally figured out one day that on the weekends, he's a jockey. Okay? Now, this is a small black child. Who's a jockey? And open the door right there. Because now we got something to talk about. If you want to be a successful jockey on the weekends, because I happen to know the horses, the guy who owns the horses he runs for. And so now we got some kind of commonality and we could develop a relationship. And we figured out, hey, this is not the behavior you need if you want to be successful. And so that's what I'm trying to say is that each, I mean, you got to take each, each case individually. And work from there. You see, you said that there's a dis you see the disconnect at that failing school. What are you telling your principals to do? What are you We're working course? every day for professional development about classroom management. Okay. And so we're closing the gap. We are closing the gap because we have eliminated those teachers that didn't want to want to conform to what we need. Okay. Now that's hard to do because we were we we're looking for all of them certified teachers right now. But if you're not going to put that kid first, how are you going to teach him? Okay? If you're not going to put forth the effort to learn about that child, then somebody else can have it. You know what I'm saying? So we had to talk to our teachers about what I call mama duties. Okay? Some days you got to be a mama to that child. Some days you got to be a counselor to that child. Some days you got to be the preacher to that child. And some days you have to be the teacher too. So, what do you think about um, suspension and in school suspension as well? Um, we so have it. We have it. I think you got to. I'm not going to let one child, if he's continuing to disrupt that classroom, I'm not going to let that one child mess up 25 of them. Okay, they came to school that day to learn. Maybe he didn't, or she didn't. So in school suspension is one way that we can remove the child from the situation so that the others can continue to learn and put him in a situation where he'll get some one-on-one -on -one tutoring with that person who's over ISS. So it's just not going down there, or she's not going down there to do nothing. We have a program that they will go through. Especially in the high school settings, even into elementary. We have an ISS room, and then we have an alternative school within the same setting. Because let's say you just do something that's mine, okay, and you just need to be removed for a period or two. But we've got ISS. But let's say you do something that you're, this is about the fourth, fifth, sixth referral. So you go to the alternative school, which is still right there where we have we put different sets of teachers in those situations so is it a good good to turn anytime my kids out of classroom that's not good okay but sometimes you got to do what you got to do so that you maintain this one within that classroom okay. I have another question. Yes, what are your thoughts on having visual performing arts and music in our schools? How would you allocate or find funding for these programs? These are very, very important. And the state is just now, they were recognizing this and they're giving us some, you know, some, some avenues for funds to do this through Title IV funds. We do it through a general fund in, in your parish. But uh, 
It's very, very big. Not all, you know, we spend a lot of time and a lot of money on athletics. Okay, we do. We spend in some situations in smaller schools that don't have, you got football, but you don't have bands, but music is, is big. It's very, very big in, in these people's, in, in our kids' lives. Okay? So we fall short. We do. We fall short in trying to provide a great program. I know in Union Parish we do. Now, let me tell you a story. I'm always was recruiting for football. Okay. Big kid, six five. Way back. Two six. Didn't play football. One. You need to play football. I stayed on him all the time. All the time. He didn't play. That young man is now a concert pianist in New York. If he played football and broke his fingers, just think what would have happened. Okay? His career would have been over. So everybody is not an athlete. Everybody doesn't get, I mean, you got music and arts. Let's talk about this. When we was in Longview, my wife's an artsy person. Okay? We had a forest. All right? And so that was that was big as far as creation from the mind. Okay, I'll be first to admit I can copy anything she made. I can create. Okay, so I want to try to find funds to make this, make sure that our kids have the opportunities to go and be a part. No question, is a great resource right here. There's people on commercials that came from our school right here in Northwestern, okay? And so, we will we will try to find some, some funds and be creative to make sure that these people have a chance. You know, I'd like to comment on that one time. I think we're all in Baton Rouge this week. Um, Max Parrish did not have one art picture. At all. You're on. And, and a lot of parishes had multiple for them. The other thing, three, uh, is Northwestern most one of the best uh, theaters in all the country. But we don't have theater at none of our schools. That's something that we need to and we need to look at because that's that's a great resource. And some, you know, I, I, my back, my minor is speech. Okay. So I took a lot of theater. But I was a guy that you put up props. You know, and so, you know, I, I got to make props. Later on, I have done a little acting in high, in high school. But, you know, but that's, I enjoyed that stuff. I really did. And public speaking. You know, some people don't like to do that. But, and I taught speech in high school. And one of the biggest things is to get people over the fear of getting in front and, and expressing yourself. Okay? Make this piece of paper express. Come alive. Make that speech come alive off that piece of paper. Only lost one kid out of all my career at Jonesboro. I never could get her up there. <coughs> a straight A student made an effing speech, but she would not get it. So, anyway. Thank you. And art music, he's such a great outlet for trouble. Yes, ma'am. Like you absolutely. <laughs> so you did it. That's right. That's why he's from last year. Next question is on budgets. What is your experience with budgets? And in the next year, what would you, what would your analysis be to rectify the situation? I've had uh, the unfortunate. Well, fortunate or unfortunate, how you want to say it. I've had extensive dealings with budget in the last two years. Union Parish, my second day on the job, I walked in and we said, hey, we have a $1.5 million deficit in our general fund. So I immediately became concerned about a budget. So we dug into it with our financial folks. Immediately I called the, the school board president and said, hey, a problem. And so we got together as a finance committee and we worked ourselves through that particular crisis. But unfortunately, this past year, 
They had to cut 2.5 million out of our budget and rip 37 people just to make the ends meet. Okay? Now, we're talking about going line by line item. And every bit of that, we're talking about grants. We're talking about Title I money. We're talking about special ed money. We're talking about general fund money. We lost revenue. We lost four mills. <coughs> the voters did not vote it back. We got a big 15 mills that's fixing to come up. And if that is not voted in, that's going to be four more million that's not going to be in the budget. So, if you have a situation where your budget is in, in the red, then you got to go back and look at certain things that that's going to be, you got to look at. Number one, 80% of your budget is personnel. Okay, you go right there. We found out that over the years of schools being closed, consolidation taking place, we found out that unfortunately the same amount of teachers came, but the same amount of kids didn't because there's four charter schools in Union Parish. Okay, so that's another topic for we'll talk about it a little bit later, but basically we found out that we were way overstaffed, way overstaffed. Now, fortunately, out of that 37 that we had to lift, we were people we were very creative to bring back a lot of the grants through other ways besides that. Okay. So as far as dealing with the budget, yes, I'm very, very fortunate that I have an ex-CFO on our, our board. And she was very, very, she worked there for 30 years, retired and came back. So that knowledge helped me a whole lot. Unfortunately, I had to, I had to let my whole business staff go and start over. Now, I'm very loyal to my, I, I, I'm a loyal guy. And I stood behind, stood behind, stood behind, and finally it just came to the point where we got my check. And we did. We did. Being a superintendent, sometimes you make tough decisions. You affect people's lives, but you got to make them. Because the bottom line, you, the taxpayer, you don't want your, your, your money to be issued in any way. Unfortunately, our budget is still going to be in the red, but not this year's fiscal budget. We're going to come in a smooth board of, excuse me, $40,000 to the black. Okay? We've been as much as 1.5, 1.6 in the red. Now, overall, we're still going to be in the red because we still got coding issues coming down from budget to budget to budget. Okay? And we're going back. Our new CFO, we were in Baton Rouge this morning talking about the MFP meeting because we're one of the five. If you look, there's five critical parishes that, that are in dire straits. We're one of them. Okay. So why? Well, the blind students, students, that's the MFP money gone. Number two, some of the millage gone. That's funds that we don't have anymore. Okay. And number three, we're overstaffed. So that, I mean, that's so. If you got a budget, number one, you go to the. Let's go look at our personnel. Then let's start looking at some of the other areas, such as buildings and grounds, and all the other buses, and all the other avenues that we as school people have. Let's see if we're overspending in those areas. Thank you. I'm going to follow up a question, Mr. Ben Bell. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, yes. You seem to talk a lot about grants. Do y'all have a grant writer in your parish? No, we don't. And that, I think that's one of the things that we're missing the boat on. Because, number one, we are cut so far to the bone that we all have to wear a lot of hats. Such as one of my uh, supervisors is a food service guy, maintenance, and transportation. So the grant writer, I'm, I'm very lucky to have one of my uh, uh, payroll clerk has written grants for the high school when she was over there. So we, we use her to, uh, you know, kind of piggyback on her knowledge. But, you know, that, that's that's an area, though, that you can tap into that if you got somebody that can devote their time 
to go find those extra, those extra dollars for you. And that doesn't have to be a general fund. Just play on somebody else's money, so to speak. Thanks. Okay, Mr. Gaskin. Good evening. How will you advise the board of all situations and issues that pertain to the schools, students, and faculty in a timely manner? Number one, if it's an emergency or we got some situations that I feel like you need to know immediately, I need to call you or text you. Now, we will have some kind of understanding how you want me to communicate with you, number one. Okay? There's a lot of different ways, and I've talked to different superintendents, and I've done it, you know, my particular board. I text a whole lot to them. I mail out letters on a periodical basis, and then just about those phone calls. Okay? Now, we got 11 members here. So, emails is good. Uh, so, I, I'm at the pleasure of the board how you want to be talk with or communicate with on normal days or normal things. Now, if it's an emergency thing, I'm going to let you know anyway. Okay. Mr. Reeves, based on your knowledge, what do you perceive the top three issues in our parish? What are your plans to address? The three things that I see, and every every parish has has their issues. Okay, but you want to know number one, uncertified teachers. I mean, uncertified teachers you have. So, number two, retention of the teachers you have. Okay. Number three, unfortunately, you do have some failing schools. So, let's take one at a time. Let's go with how these will address these. Number one, uncertified teachers. Now, a lot of those teachers, I grant to say, are just that close to passing the practice. Or they just have a long struggle to pass the English. The math. Okay? Now, what we have done in Union Parish to help the people we have that are uncertified is that we have brought in extra teachers. You know, we set it up, we pay people to come in the afternoons afterwards to the tutor for the test. Okay? We've done that to try to help. I know that the, <clears throat> there's a teacher shortage in the state. We talked about it this morning with John White when I was in Baton Rouge. But John White will leave. So now we hope that the new state superintendent will help us, superintendents of these of our parish, Napa's parish, how we're going to address this. Now, teacher retention, teacher retention, keeping the good ones you got. We all know they can go to the southern parish and make a good pay rate. They can go to Red River and get a pay rate. In Union Parish, you got Lincoln right here. You got Washita over here. I got charter schools in my district that pay more than we do. So, I don't have any money. No, I looked at your budget. I just I briefly, I, I didn't dive into your budget. But well, do we have excess money to pay the teacher? Not right now, we don't. But, so we got to be creative again. So, I was going to uh, say, I. We came up with a plan in Union Parish to kind of piggyback what the input does. Okay? We're gonna we're gonna pay you a little extra if you come if you don't miss, okay? And I worked at through Title One Funds. Contact the state, say, hey, can we do this? I said yes. So I set aside two hundred thousand for our teachers in Union Parish. On a pilot program, just teachers now. Now, the Ample Parish pays everybody, every employee, okay? Every, so, had it all set up, state cut. So, I mean, they, they took away the X amount of our, our Title I funds. So, we, we didn't able to do that. But we could do something like that. Also, hey, your calendar, you have a teacher friendly calendar. That's, that's, that's good. Because you look, every month we have opportunity to 
have a day off. So that's, an, that's, an, that's appealing to the teachers. And then you also you look at the four day work weeks. Now, failing schools. We have a failing school in our district. I, yesterday on my way to Baton Rouge, I dropped in on a couple of schools. Five of them to be exact. But I just wanted to look. I just wanted to see. And one of them happened to be a fighting school. And I talked with the principal. I'm not going to tell you which one because I don't want But I, I talked to her. And she is, you know, she's pulling her hair out because she's frustrated. Because it's the curriculum work. I do know at one place you're now putting in Zern. Okay. You move Zern up to third grade. We put Zern in at our, last year in our elementary school, too. We did exactly what the state says. I hope the state's not watching tonight. We did exactly what they said. Now, did some of our teachers didn't teach with enough fidelity? Yeah, but you probably get us there a little bit. But our scores went from a D to an F. We played the game like you told us to play, and it went the other way. Red River had that same thing on a school racially built up just like our people. On our city schools had the same thing. So what they're trying to tell us is if you're patient enough, it will come back. Well, how long are we going to have to be patient? I said, well, my third year, it looks good. Well, all right. I'm going to be fired after that. You know what I'm saying? So what I'm saying is you've got to look at the curriculum. Is the curriculum matching what's going on in that school? Number two, are the teachers fired up about that curriculum? Because that's that's one of the things is that teachers who have a little experience behind their belt, they don't like this new stuff we're having to do. Okay? And so you don't either. I don't either. We had this conversation in a church the other night. Because we got some concerned citizens about, hey, how can we help make our schools better? So I stood up and I told them, I said, look, back when you went to school, two plus two equal four. Done deal. Let's move on to the next. Today, we got to figure out why it's four. Okay? We want them to think a little bit. Well, I, you know, everybody said, we need more homework and all kinds of things, but. So we got to look at teachers, our curriculum, and then we got to look at administrators. Now. Are they doing everything they need to do? Are they qualified to make the tough decisions to go in there and help that teacher? Do they have the knowledge to do that? Did we, as a central staff up here, give them the tools to be successful? Then we got to look at us too. And our supervisors here, are we giving them enough PD? professional development so they can be successful in that classroom. And the thing is uh, that the common denominator here is there's two things. What's going on at that house and that teacher. That's gonna make that's gonna make the students. Those are two factors that I look at right here. Thank you. Thank you. About um, an issue with the curriculum, yes, and um, I just recall um, tonight someone mentioned about other curriculum that would work for the particular parish that the state would the state requires. So well, we all got the, we all got the tier one. Okay, that's that's the tier one curriculum. Now, what we did, you, just for example, Eureka Math versus Art. Okay. Yeah. Which is better? It depends on who you talk to. Okay? I can go, I can bring in a state, you know, the people that work for the state that help us, and they say, oh, this is, this is what you need to do. Or this one is what you need to do. But we've got to figure out, and that's what I told my folks in the Union Parish, what's good for our Union Parish kids? Okay? What's good for Natchez Parish kids? If we got to combine the two of them together to make it work, Let's do it. Okay? Let's do it. And I, if you look at the, the schedules that our elementary schools teachers have to go through, their whole day is planned for them. They can't even go to the bathroom. 
Okay. So what we did, because we are TAP school too. Okay. So you got to do so much professional development every week. And RTI training for this tier one stuff every week. So when do I get my time to relax? What I call Facebook time. You give a teacher 15 minutes to relax. Because you got to remember now, elementary teachers, they go to they go to the cafeteria with them. Okay? They go with them. So I finally told some of those state folks, I said, look, we've got to take some of this away from off our teachers. Okay? We've got to take some pressure off the group. And so we did. We eliminated some of the some of the, the requirements that the state said we had to do. Slaps on the hand. Hey, okay, do that. We just cut 2.5 million, rip 37. What else? How else are you going to hurt us? So we got to show those teachers that we're going to stand up for them. We're going to do what is right to give you the opportunity to teach that child. And if we have to give, you know, if we have to bend, I'm not saying break the rules, but I'm just saying we got to, what does Natchez Parish kids need? That's what we got to do. Board members, uh, we are not in a crunch for time, but we are behind uh, on our. I'll show my answers. <laughs> Ms. Yes, Mr. Reeves, what steps would you take to evaluate the current leadership positions within the central office? Please provide a time when you had to repurpose an employee to move to a more productive position. Once again, unfortunately, unfortunately, when I took over the uh, Union Parish superintendent job and when I was interim superintendent at Jackson Parish, we had to evaluate our personnel in the office. We had to reassign, we had to move people around into positions that fit their needs. Okay? Like I told you all ago, I'm going to, if, if I'm lucky enough to be the superintendent here, I'm going to come in, evaluate who's in this office here. Who's here? Who's in this central office? Now, how will I do that? What's their job description? What are they supposed to be doing? What does their job description tell them that what they're supposed to do? Then, I have, I guess it's good or bad, several years under my belt. Okay? And so, I know a little bit about what each supervisor should be doing. Now, not necessarily in Nike Paris. Now, I've got to, you know, we've got to come in here and evaluate what's going on. You've got to hit the ground running. And you're going to come, you're going to meet with each one of these. And you're going to look, hey, what, how's your feeling? What, what do you think about your job? Are you doing your job? How can I help you do your job better? So, after an evaluation process, we would look and say, okay, if we need to rearrange, then we got to have, then we can. We can't be scared not to do that. If it's going to make our parish better, then we need to do it. That doesn't mean we have to. Okay? We may evaluate everybody and say, hey, you're doing a good job. Continue doing a good job. But if we see that we need to do some things to make it better, we're going to do that too. Now, <clears throat> timeline. Time is now. Time is now. Okay? You want somebody to come in here to evaluate what's going on, make changes where necessary, and be a leader. Okay, that's what you're looking for. So it's hard to put a time exactly how long, a month or two weeks or a year or so forth, but it will be evaluated. That staff will be evaluated very, very quick. I've got a follow up to that. Um, Mr. Reeves, have you ever had to, and you said you read some people, but you, have you ever had to, like Mr. Phelps said, repurpose some employees? <coughs> yes, sir. We've had to put them on intensive plan. Sometimes it, it's not doing their job. We get an opportunity to, uh, in other words, give the you know, due process. We, we meet with them and say, hey, if you're not you're not fulfilling what you need to do, and so we sit down and give them a kind of a refocus speech. Give them give them some guidelines that this is what we want you to do, and then we're gonna give you X amount of days to get this done. If you can re reroute your attitude or whatever holding you back from being a productive employee, then that needs to happen. 
if it doesn't, then I will give you a time. If that doesn't happen, then your days with us will be ended. And yes, I've had to do that. What experience have you had with the transportation program and how do you manage a contract system? I've had extensive uh, knowledge of transportation. My dad was in transportation uh, supervisor. So I grew up through driving buses. Been driving with a school bus <coughs> 30 years. Yeah. In Jackson Parish, I was over the maintenance and transportation. As interim superintendent, we were on the DSEG order. I had to reroute the whole parish. So I redid, F, uh, I hate to say I all the time, but we rerouted the whole parish. We did the whole thing to meet the DSEG order that's judged for. Okay? So in Union Parish, I still have my hand in transportation because that is a big part of the budget. Okay, you got mechanics. Now I know we're down here. We have we we outsource it here. Okay, right. But there we do have mechanics. And then you got all the buses that things that go wrong with the bus and drivers. Okay, and so those are things that uh, yes, I've had experience with all of the above. Just about my whole career as a, as an educator. Now experience with a chart with outsourcing. We've always looked at it, and I've always been on the ground floor of sitting down and talking about it, but we never did it because what held us back was, okay, what are you going to do with the retirement of those, those bus drivers who are kind of in limbo, okay? What are you going to do with that? Like a, a driver had 10 years experience, so how are you going to, is that 10 years just gone? And so those were some of the, the issues we had. I know that some of the issues you have is that you were having a little bit of trouble whoever runs it because that's a big job because you got to have buses you got to have bus drivers if they don't show up you got to have subs and you got to you got to have a schedule for trips athletic ball games so i do know in the past that you did have a little trouble with that as far as you know the charge people Whoever was running it was not necessarily upholding their bar. So you had they replaced that guy. And I think if I'm correct now, things get better. So, and I saw, and I was watching some of the buses yesterday as I was going through. And until you understand how it all goes and the intertwines of making those routes work, going from this school, got to be at this school. You know, it, it's a big job. It is a big job. It's one that uh, I've had my hand in all my career. Mr. Harris? Mr. Reeves, how will you ensure equitable opportunities, opportunities grounded in support, tools, resources, and time to learn despite race, zip code, or family background? All right. My wife reminded me. Uh, the other day that this is my this is the way I feel when I look at a child or I look at a student first thing I see is the color of their eyes the color of their eyes I don't see their skin that's the way I've been since the day that I walked into the school system that's the day that's the way I feel today <laughs> now we've got to give resources to those students who have the greatest need. Now, let's look at the scale of what I'm trying to tell you say here. You have you have the, the student that's up here. Okay. They need their resources too. And you got the child that's down here. He needs his resources too. Then you have those in the middle. So one of the greatest challenges as a teacher in that classroom is you got little Johnny that's IQ's up here, 
And you got other little Johnny that's like down here. So how do I get the resources to him? How do I get the resources to her? Because they're both important. They both need my attention as a teacher. So I, I, I put it in athletic terms. I hate to do that all the time. Let's just put it in athletic terms. You can't make a free throw. What are we going to do? Work on dribbling? No. We're going to work on free throws. Now, you can go over here and work on free throws the same time I'm working with this one over here. Dribbling. We can do that at the same time. All right? So we as, as teachers and educators, we've got to give our teachers, you know, now we teach in pods. We have round circles. Okay, you, I'm going to teach this table a little bit. Now, when I, y'all, y'all go on, I'll be back in a minute. So that's the way that we're going to have to do it is that, is that we have to give them the tools to do it. Now, where we're falling short, and Union Parish is, is that Paris that in that classroom to help with some of these kids, help these teachers to get these students going. Well, we had to cut Paris. So in turn, that's cutting some of the, you know, some of the resources or cutting some of the services that we should be giving a child. I know I'm kind of skirting around the issue here, but to answer your question is that we want to make sure that all our students, all our students, have what they need to be successful. Please explain your description of an instructional leader and provide specific examples of how you have demonstrated this with faculty and staff. Okay. As an instructional leader, you are the persons in charge of making sure that you have the curriculum all the materials that you need. You also make sure you have all the professional development that you need for your teachers. As a superintendent, you want to make sure that your staff has the knowledge to do this. Okay? You as a superintendent, yeah, you should be, and I will be, if I'm lucky enough to get this position, I will be in the school. But you got to understand, the superintendent also has to be in his office some too. So there's a there's there's multi schools in this package. If I happen to be at Gold Honor and things are going on somewhere else, say Niagara Central, I've got to have faith in our staff that they can handle. They can be the instructional leader. Do we have instructional leaders on our staff? That's part of that evaluation process that we'll go through. Yes, I have, I have been instructional leader, especially the principal. At that level, you are instructional leader. Now, we have supervisors who are instructional leaders. We have superintendents instructional leaders. We're all instructional leaders. Those who are there that have the closest contact with the kids are the ones who are instructional leaders. And that's the teacher. Really, that's the teacher. But, okay. How have we demonstrated this when I took over John Brown? There was lots of issues we had to do. Number one, we had to get those kids in class. Okay, had to get them in class. Number two, we had to get the teachers to teach with fidelity. Okay, back then high school at work was big. I don't know if y'all remember the high school at work. That was the, that was a big deal that the state was coming and said, "Hey, this will help you get you going," and it did. We had success. So we took the high school at work concepts and put it before the teachers. Now, how we did this is that you had to be there every every day. You got to go into the classroom. But I set up a schedule. I didn't I, I didn't like faculty meetings. Okay. I feel like you put in your eight hours, you're ready to go home. Okay. So we set it up where I had faculty meeting many, not many, but many. M I N I how you spell many. Okay. So Monday morning I met with all the math teachers. 7 15 to 7 15 minutes. We all stood up. Why don't we sit up? If you sit down, you got to you make a quick meeting when everybody stands up. English on Tuesday, social studies on Wednesday, extra group activity if you talk PE or whatever on Thursday. So we every Monday I met with my English teacher. What's your lesson? Where are you at today? I'm gonna be in there. Bell ring. All the different things to get our kids engaged immediately. Okay, immediately. And then once you've got them going, 
what are you gonna teach? What's your goal? What's your vision? So we had to put that in place. And so I did that in the morning time. So I knew as a teacher, 715, 730, I had faculty meeting every month. And it worked out good for us. Now I can't say that it didn't work anywhere else, but it, it worked at Jonesboro. Okay. And so I was the instructional leader on that part. With the help of other people. Okay. <clears throat> You know, it takes, it takes a, a village to make all this happen. <coughs> so I took what other people advised from high school at work. They came in, provided professional development to me, to my people, and we were able to, to make it work. And so we were able to go from a D to a C and move up 18 points. That's pretty good. I was proud of that. <coughs> Okay, any thoughts on that? Um, I would like to know how do you plan on introducing yourself to our community, um, our businesses, and our, our staff? You're going to laugh when I say this, but you know, the first people I'm going to go talk to are janitors and cafe ladies. I'm going to them because they are important to me. You want to know why the school is moving? Shaking, go talk to me. And you can call anyone that I've ever dealt with. They'll say, Oh, yeah, go through. You can come through. Okay. They may call me. But anyway, or Mr. Reed. But I will I will introduce myself. I happen to know a lot of the, the officials who are already here because of our past experiences when we all went to school here. So I do, I, I know. Um, elected officials. I have some contacts with the paper, but uh, I will make myself extremely visible. I want to talk to the chain. I want to go to the coalition of ministers and set up things where I can go talk in your churches and your homes. I don't mind talking. I really don't. I have a good message to, to deliver. Our Natchez Parish message that will be put out. So how we do this? So we live in the age of social media. Okay, that'd be one way. Technology. This is this is neat. There's a lot of people watching us tonight. Video streaming. So we're gonna make sure that the, that my name, our name, will be put out there, and that we got a great message to, to put out there. If I would, would you drive over there? No, ma'am. I will live here. Where's here? Nagas. Well, I, well, I say here. Nagas, big parish. Number two geographic. Well, my wife told me we cannot. So we live in Jonesboro on my mother's old place, and a trailer about to take the front. Okay, which that was good for us, but we had ten dollars. So. <laughs> She told us no more farms. In the Union Parish, I do own a home in Union Parish. I own, a, I own a nice home. I was very lucky to have that home. But I plan, if, if I'm lucky enough to be here, we're going to sell that house and we're going to be right here. Because I I, lived, I was here six years and I had a great time. And I, I'm looking forward to coming back. Hey, Mama. Excuse me. Last question. How do you plan to monitor leading critical indicators to support all children performing at grade level or above? And how would you communicate that information to staff? One thing we got to do is data. We can data, 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 data. Data tells exactly what's going on. Okay. So we as a staff, now who's the staff? We're talking about supervisors. We're talking about principal. We're talking about counselors. We're talking about curriculum coordinators. We all must look at the data, but then you got to include the teachers too, because they're the ones that's got to disseminate this down to the kids. Okay, so we got to look at the data to see where our deficiencies are. After we come up with our our deficiencies and find out what we need to do, we need to figure out if our children are on grade level. Okay, we find out there's a lot of children that are not. On grade level. How are we going to get them back to the grade level? 
And so through professional development, the faculty meetings, we need to move this information down to the teachers. Now you understand, if we want, if we want all our student scores to stay where they are or get better, that teacher is what makes that happen. The teacher makes it happen. Now, but we've got to give that teacher the tools to make it happen. Right? We've got to give them the knowledge. So we're going to make sure that our staff is communicated to because that's the key to the whole thing is communication. Communication between the superintendent, supervisors, supervisors down to the principals, principals down to the teachers, the teachers to the children. And somewhere along the way, we've got to involve our parents too. Okay? That's, that's, they got to know what's going on, how to help from their end. Ms. Reeves, we are at the end of our questions and your closing remarks you are just about right on time. You have eight minutes. Eight minutes. Yes. I want to thank y'all for what you do and what you're trying to do for, for this parish because it's a tough job. It's a, it's a tough job. I know y'all had a long day yesterday, you had a long night tonight, you probably got a long night tomorrow. And then you gotta sit there and you gotta trim down these candidates. And there's a lot of good candidates that come before you, I know that. So why Ted Bridge? Okay? Why Ted Bridge? Well, number one, I, I will be the first to admit, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shape. I will say that. But the strengths that I have our number one compassion for the kids, the compassion for our, for our teachers, the loyalty that I will show to our employees, and the devotion that I have to Magnus Parish will be unprecedented. I have, I have the ability, I'm not bragging, I'm just trying to tell you, I, I do have the ability to be people. <coughs> not all the time, but 99% of the time. I want to make people feel happy. I think if you got happy employees and you got happy students, we got happy parents and we got happy board members. Okay? I started a program in Union Parish. I give out a t shirt. It's got a happy face on it. I call it a happy face program. I walk down the hall and I see a teacher having a great day. Oop, come in. We take a picture. I give her a t shirt. We put it in the back. I see a child having a great day. Smile and having a great day. Stop. Picture. So I want, I know morale is tough, especially in those schools that are failing because they feel like they, they're out there on the island by themselves. They're not. They're not. We got to show them some love. Okay? We got to show them that this superintendent cares about you. This superintendent is going to be around. Okay? can do it every day. We have duties here. I know superintendents, you gotta you gotta schedule your day. And I'm gonna schedule time if I'm not lucky enough to be in this position to be out there. You can't sit in that ivory tower over there and, and, and rule. You have to be with your folks. I have driven buses as superintendent for union parish. Okay. We short subs. I can roll up my sleeves and do anything. If I need to mop, if I need to sweep, if I need to serve food, if I need to teach, I'm not above any of that. Okay? This is this is an us program. This is not a Ted Bridge program. It won't be a Ted Bridge program. This is going to be a Mackage Parish program. A vision that you, you want conveyed to me, and our my vision with your vision will be like this, and our vision will community be communicated. I say, excuse me, communicated to. Our teachers and our support staff, and we're going to work to make this parish you know, make it good. It's got a lot of potential. Okay, you have already set a lot of good things in motion. We just need to bump them on up. Okay, when you when you were elected to this board, you took on a big responsibility. Okay, and you hear from the public. I bet you get a few bumps on. Okay, so. With your help, my help, and the help of our employees, we can we can make Napish the place that we want to be. 
Thank y'all for the opportunity tonight. I know you're tired, and I'm going to be quiet. <laughs>